This week in lab, we're going to be learning about transistors, what transistors are and how they work. My name is Lee Brinson, and I'm an electrical engineering instructor at Salt Lake Community College. Transistors come in two basically different or two basic different um, technologies, and we'll be studying both of them this week. There's the bijunction transistor, or the BJT, and the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, or the MOSFET, or just plain old FET transistor. This week we're going to be looking at different applications of transistors. Transistors are very versatile, versatile devices that can be used in a lot of different applications. We'll be looking at them as amplifiers. We'll be looking at the trans transistors that can be used as transducers or sensors. We'll look at transistors as electrical switches, electrically controlled switches, and then also look at uh, transistors and how they are used to implement the basic digital logic gates of digital computers. Transistors are a three-terminal device. This is a picture of the original, the first operating transistor. It was developed by Bell Labs back in 1947. As you can see, there is a connector here, a terminal here, and then a terminal between the two. Over the 60 years since they were developed, transistors have gotten smaller and smaller and become more and more versatile. Current state-of-the-art has well over 2 billion transistors on a single chip. Now, transistors come in different sizes for different purposes. This is a single, relatively low-power, discrete transistor. It's got the three uh, terminals on it, and there would just be one transistor in this. Then we go on up to larger power ones where there's actually got a um, metal backing on it for heat dissipation and then you can get even higher powered ones where the entire transistor is encased in metal to increase the um, the uh, heat transferability from the transistor because they do give off a fair amount of heat and uh, power loss through heat. First of all the bipolar junction transistor it's referred to as bipolar because it has two separate types of areas. We've seen and talked about doping semiconductors when we were talking about diodes. So the bipolar junction transistor, or the BJT, consists of two areas of one type of doping and then a smaller, lighter doped area in between the two. So in this case, this is an NPN transistor because it consists of a heavily doped, larger N area a very lightly doped, narrow P area, P doped area, and then again a heavily doped N area. So there's the three terminals on it. One terminal is called the collector, this middle terminal is called the base, and the other terminal here is called the emitter. This is the symbol for the bipolar junction transistor, or again the acronym for them is BJT. The general idea with a transistor is that you can use a relatively small voltage applied to one of the terminals to control the current flowing through the transistor. So in this BJT symbol here, we have the base and the emitter, and the voltage across the base to the emitter we refer to as VBE. And as you can see, it is effectively a PN junction. So when the voltage here gets to be about 0.7 volts, nominally 0.7 volts, you'll get conduction through the transistor. Current coming from the collector through the base on out the emitter. The second type of technology, a transistor technology we're going to talk about is the field effect transistor. They also are three terminal devices. And in a very similar way, you can control the current flowing through the transistor by controlling the voltage between the middle terminal and this terminal here. This is called the gate. This is called the source. Source, And the voltage between the gate and source is known as VGS. Now, in the field effect transistor, the idea is that you put a positive voltage on here the positive voltage repels positively um, 
positively charged holes. And I guess I should back up and point out that just from the basic structure of it, in this case, this is what is known as an N-channel or an N-MOS transistor. It consists of a body that is doped with P-type dopant and then two wells here of N-type dopant. And without connecting anything, there is no pathway for the electrons to flow. But by applying a voltage to the gate relative to the source, as I started to say, it repels the holes and draws a positive voltage, will repel the holes and draw in negatively charged electrons from the drain and the source. This terminal up here is known as the drain. And thus creates a channel or a conducting region between the drain and the source such that when a voltage is, re is applied between the drain and the source, and we'll refer to that as VDS, the voltage from the drain to the source then causes current to flow through the, in this case, the N channel. This channel can be increased in size and thereby increase the car current capability, current carrying capability of the channel. And so what we have here is a small voltage gives you a small channel, a large voltage gives you a large channel. Transistors, whether you're talking about BJTs or field effect transistors, can be thought of or are analogous to a water valve that's controlling the flow of water. Now if you have pressure against the valve, but the valve is closed so that it doesn't allow anything through, you have pressure but no water flow through. If you open the valve just a little bit you'll get a small amount of water. If you open up the valve a whole lot you get a whole lot of water and if, and if you open it and close it and open and close it then the flow of the water through here will be related to how much this valve was opened. As you open it more comes out. As you reduce the opening less current flows through it. It's similar in a transistor whether we're talking about this field effect transistor or the um, BJT, for small voltages on the center terminal, there's very small, if any, current, current conducting capability in the transistor. The transistor is effectively cut off. It's not going to conduct anything. As you start to increase the voltage here, it takes a certain amount of voltage to get it to the point that it will carry anything, but beyond that then, very small voltage changes at the middle terminal can create significant changes in the current going through it. So it takes a very small voltage here to control the size of or the conductability of the transistor. So what we're saying is that the, it's like having a water valve that is voltage controlled. The bigger the voltage, the more current goes through. The smaller the voltage, the less current goes through. The symbol for the field effect transistor is this. And you'll notice the symbolism of it showing this channel that can be controlled by, this, uh, by the voltage here on the gate. Again, the terminals are known as the drain, the gate, and the source. The arrow will always be on the source pointing in the direction of conventional current flow. As I mentioned, transistors can be used in a lot of different applications. This first application we're going to be looking at is known as a, as a, a phototransistor where the transistor itself is controlled by light impinging upon it. So it's actually able to sense photons of light and the more photons of light impinging on it, the more conductivity you have through the transistor. Two different applications of that are in um, fiber optic communications, a transistor, a phototransistor is used at the receiving end so that when the light comes out of the um, fiber optic, the transistor is able to sense that light and convert the light signal into an electrical signal. Another example of using transistors as sensors is in perimeter detection. Here we've got lasers shining between a source and a transistor. And as long as there's light present, the uh, 
the transistor knows that the beam has not been broken, but if somebody gets in the way and, and interrupts that beam, then the transistor can detect that interruption, and the circuitry can then perform the appropriate uh, actions to having that beam broken. We also talked about, or transistors can also be used as amplifiers. Amplification is the process of taking a relatively small waveform, a relatively small voltage or current, and amplifying it to make it larger. Transistors, by their nature, are amplifying devices. Coming back to our water, vol water valve analogy, very small voltages on the controlling terminal, or very small, effectively very small voltages on the handle of the valve can make the voltage or can make the valve open and allow large amounts of current through. So again, a relatively small voltage here can make a large change in the current there. And that's basically what amplification is. A small controlling signal causes large variations at the output. Transistors can also be used as switches, and it's a very common application. In the lab this week, we're going to be using it to control a motor, to turn a motor off and on, and then we're also going to be building up a number of logic gates. A real common application of transistors as switches is in digital logic circuitry. We're looking here at metal oxide semiconductor, or MOS technology. And what we want to show here is how you can implement digital logic operations using transistors. The first one that we're going to look at is what is known as an AND gate. It performs the logical AND operation. The logical AND operation says that both A and B must be on in order for there to be an output. So here's our AND gate. It has two inputs. The inputs can either be tied to ground, 0 volts, or they can be tied to plus 5 volts. And you can have both of them grounded, both of them plus 5, or you can have one ground, one 5, or you can have this one grounded and that one 5. In other words, there are four different possible input options on this. Now if you stop and think about it, these two are the gates, these are the controlling terminals. If this one is pulled to 5 volts, it's able to conduct current. On the other hand, if it's tied to 0 volts, it doesn't induce the channel and it has no ability to conduct. It's effectively an open switch and similarly there. So let's just take a look at this. If both of these are off, if both of these have 0 volts applied to them, there will be no current flowing through from the plus voltage through the transistors to ground. If there's no current flowing through this resistor, there will be no voltage drop across it, and the output will be zero volts. Now, what happens if we open one of the, if we uh, close, I should say, close one of the switches and thus allow current to flow? What happens if we put five volts here, leave this one at zero? This one then is able to conduct, but because it is in series with this one, which is still not conducting, there will be no current flowing through. On the other hand, if we put 5 volts here and 0 volts here, we've got the same situation. This time this one can conduct, but not this one. So we get no conduction through these series combination of these two transistors unless both of these two terminals are pulled to 5 volts. Under those circumstances, then the current flows. We now have current through this resistor, and the voltage at this point then will be at the high output voltage, assuming that these are ideal transistors and there's no voltage drop across them when they are conducting, then the output would be 5 volts. That's how this AND gate is, op is implemented. The output voltage will be 5 if either A or B or both of them are open, are tied to 0. So A and B 0, output 0. A 0, B 5, 0, 5 for A, B 0 gives us still an output. They've got to both be positive in order to pull this output to the, uh, to the 5 volt, 
to the 5 volts. This gate here has the two transistors in parallel with each other with inputs A and B. This is what is known as an OR gate and performs the logical OR operation. ORing tells us, or the, the, the uh, OR operation is defined by this truth table, and its output will be 5, or true. The output will be 5 if either A or B, or both A and B, are pulled high. What does that mean? Well, here again is our voltage. We've got a resistor here tied to ground. If neither of these are, if neither of these inputs are high, if neither of them have five volts on them, then in neither case will there be current flowing. There will be no current through the resistor, and therefore the voltage here will be zero. But if either A or B are pulled high, if either the A voltage or the B voltage goes to five volts, it will open up a pathway for current to flow. Current will flow across the resistor, and the resistor then will push the output voltage here to 5 volts. So in this case, either A being on or B being on give us the output, and of course both of them being on will also give us the output. Finally, we have what is known as an inverter. An inverter simply says that if this is your input A and that's your output, then if A is 0, the output will be 1. And if A is 5 volts, I'm sorry, output will be 5 volts. And if A is 5 volts, if you pull this to plus 5 volts, the output will be 0. Let's understand how that works. Once again, you've got 5 volts here tied at this point, ground at this point. Now the resistor is on the 5 volt side of the transistor. In our previous two examples, the resistor was on the ground side of the transistor so that when nothing was going through it, the output was pulled to zero. Now we have the output connected to the transistor on the, in this case, the drain side. The resistor between the 5 volts and the transistor, such that if there's no current going through here, there'll be no voltage drop across the resistor, and the output then is pulled up to the positive voltage, or plus 5 volts. There's no current going through here when A, the voltage at this terminal, is zero, so that there is no conducting path through the transistor. So if the transistor is not conducting, if A is zero, the output will be high. On the other hand, if we pull A high to 5 volts, the transistor then is able to conduct, and the output then is pushed down to ground because we now have current flowing through the resistor, and the 5 volts will be dropped across the resistor and bring this nominally to zero. Now, throughout this whole discussion, we've been talking about the IR, we've been assuming that the transistors are ideal and that there is no voltage drop across them while they're conducting. In fact, that's not exactly right. Under these circumstances, when it's conducting, it's said to be, the transistor is said to be saturated. And there is a finite, albeit small, voltage across the transistor when it's saturated. And that saturation voltage ranges anywhere from 0.1 to maybe 0.2 or 0.3 volts, depending upon the structure of the transistor. Before you come to class this week, take a look at the, at the um, workbook and look at the circuits involving the amplifier, the motor controlling switch, and the digital logic gates and familiarize yourself with those because this will take a little bit of time. We're going to actually be building up the, uh, the basic logic gates using the uh, discrete transistors and that takes a little bit of time. So make sure you look at it before you get to class and we'll see you in class.